So chapter 144 is finally out and it was honestly a pretty relaxed chapter compared to the last few we had. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see the ramifications of what happened last chapter when Ruby kissed Aqua and what his reaction was. Hopefully we'll get that soon, but yeah, I'm just gonna go over this chapter first. The chapter opens with another scene being filmed. This one is none other than the scene with Goro at the hospital, and we actually get our first look at Melt as Goro as well. It's not bad, but unlike Ruby or Akko's roles, I can tell that it's Melt pretty easily. That's fine though as the narrator begins explaining how filming a movie is essentially a fight against the schedule, primarily when it comes to shooting on a location. It's like basically when you go to a real place, like a real hospital to film. In the film industry, it's common to practice film and hard to secure locations ahead of time. Like with the hospital example again, the hospital they're doing is open during the day, so they'd film mostly during late night when no one but the crew and actors are around. Because of having to prioritize filming on location first, films are usually shot out of order in terms of the story. Some films even shoot the last scene of the movie first. Of course, with the main star of the 15 year live movie being essentially a rookie, sometimes it's just better to shoot the film in chronological order first. And we can see that's what they're doing since Goro's filming his scenes, which means I should be pregnant by this point. But just as Melt feels relieved that his scene is finally over, he turns and comes face to face with the disgusted Ruby. Seeing Ruby express her disappointment with a sigh, Melt just asks what's up. It turns out, according to Ruby, Melt is doing his performance all wrong. She goes on by saying her sensei should be more dignified and have both sensitivity and core strength. Of course, Melt is like what's this girl yapping about now? He questions if Ruby is just unhappy with him, even calling her a rookie. However, Ruby doesn't think that's it and tells Melt that she thinks his role is actually very important to the story, especially for the future of it. I mean, we know what Ruby means by that. Goro is the one who becomes Ai's son after all. Melt doesn't know this so he's basically like, if this role is so important, then why is he only film in the last scene of the movie? Which is fair, but Ruby just disrespects Bro further by saying she can't believe they chose such an actor for this role. Even though Melt is seething behind her, Ruby doesn't give two fucks and actually keeps going. She questions who's even responsible for such careless casting, and that they should judge based on acting skill and not clout basically. I mean she might have a point there, but she goes even further saying that this is actually just cosplay, and that Heiki would have been much better for the role, which is wild to say in front of Melt. If I was Melt, I don't even know if I'd take that much disrespect. Melt even tells her that it's getting a bit hurtful now and asks Ruby to stop. But Ruby just keeps going, this time saying she's a fan of the original work. Of course, Melt says that this movie isn't even based on original work, but Ruby just says ham actors like him can only say foolish things like that. Melt should consider the scene he's doing right now is based on a real person and a real place. Talking like she's the veteran here, Ruby says that there should be a minimal level of respect, even in acting and questions how many years has Melt even been in the industry. To that, Melt just asks if she's been infected with Kana's nastiness towards him somehow. I mean, Ruby is going off on Melt even more than Kana did too. But the thing is, Melt tells Ruby that he didn't even need to be told all that. Holding the glasses he wore as Goro, Melt tells her that he knows his acting skills are far from perfect. So all Melt can do right now is compete with all the struggle thrown his way and make do with the effort he puts in. Then he says that they put more effort into understanding his character over the others. At first, Ruby isn't too accepting of that and tells him that his understanding of the character seems to be pretty off the mark. Hearing all that leaves Melt surprised Goro even has such a passionate fan like Ruby. If only Melt knew he was talking to the number one greatest Goro fan and potential lover. However, as Melt begins to remove his jacket, Ruby notices a certain pin he was wearing underneath it. The pin is from Ai's second tour and she's intrigued by seeing it. Melt himself didn't know much about them, but they were on sale at the merchandise shop, so he bought them. He didn't know Ai's stuff were actually so expensive, but since he realized that Goro was an Ai fan, he asked the costume department to let him wear it. Ruby has some doubt though and questions if that were the case, then why was Melt wearing the pin as if he were trying to hide it? If he wears it in a place where no one can see it, then it won't show up on camera. But this time, Melt tells Ruby to listen. If Goro was such a genuine fan, then perhaps the reason why he wouldn't wear it so blatantly in front of Ai was because he seemed to be more of the type to support Ai quietly on the sideline, being indirect and discreet about things. Hearing that, Ruby says Melt speaks like he knows Goro well. However, Melt continues by saying Goro must have been a genuinely kind person, especially according to Goro's backstory. It seemed to Melt that Goro became a hardcore fan because of the influence of a certain patient who passed away. That patient was none other than Serena, but Melt would have no way of knowing that. Yet yeah, he could still tell that Goro genuinely cared for that patient. And you know what? In his imagination, Goro received that pin from none other 
than that patient herself. That's why the doctor keeps on them, almost like it's a symbol of their feelings for that patient. And that right there is enough to actually completely win Ruby over. Doing a complete 180, Ruby pats Melt on the shoulder, with stars glowing vibrantly in her eyes, and states that he has passed. The Ruby verification test is now complete. Even Melt is confused. One second Ruby was ranting about him, and now she accepts him? But Ruby just states that if you already understood, he should have told her before. Now that she thinks about it, that performance he just did might have actually been a great one, with Goro's weakness and kindness shining through. Melt is still confused though, as Ruby states that this role could be perfect for him. At this point, Ruby is really just saying the complete opposite of what she was saying before. Ruby says she's being serious though. Like even during his performance during the Tokyo Blade play, she thought Melt did great. In fact, she's always thought that if it's Melt, he can do it. Which has to be the craziest cap yet. But Ruby has come to respect him and wants him to teach her many things. So it looks like now we're getting the Melt and Ruby student-teacher relationship. Assuming they even interact again after this chapter. But Melt realizes that he can't just stay a rookie forever. And perhaps Ruby might even be able to learn a thing or two from him. Melt tells Ruby that she won't be getting any special treatment just because she's Akko's sister though. The first thing he'll do is teach her how to behave towards her seniors. Put on his glasses like he's actually Goro, Melt tells Ruby to follow his lead, which he gladly does. And that pretty much wraps up Melt's part of the chapter. To be honest, I really like seeing the development of his character in this chapter. Like with his way of understanding the character he's playing. Unlike others, he has to try much harder to get into character, like with Goro where he was able to get a deep understanding of Goro through how he was as a fan of Ai. It's a deeper, more specific form of emotional act than you could say. Like when he was able to relate to Kizami from the Tokyo Bay performance. He found what type of person Kizami was and why he was able to make such a miserable face. Being able to get into a character like that is what allowed him to perform well and is the key to allow him to grow further as an actor. However, besides his development for Melt, there is one more part of the chapter. It seems like a day has passed as we see a bird just sitting on a branch before Ruby walks out the house, stretching and yawning before hearing someone greet her. Looking up at the branch, Ruby sees none other than the crow girl sitting where that bird just was. Almost like the bird transformed into the crow girl. But the crow girl asks Ruby how it feels to reunite with someone she admires. She's probably talking about Ruby seeing Goro again through Melt's scenes. Ruby says she does feel a little bit nostalgic, but she already knows the real Goro is actually by her side. Now Ruby comments on how the core girl really does appear anywhere and questions how she always moves around. Does she take a bus? That would be funny to see, but the core girl just says that it's reckless to even reveal the mystery of the gods. Almost like she's confirming she's a god herself. Apparently there are even a few special people who want to worship the core girl as a family tradition. Those special people are actually nearby in this land, where Shintoism is deeply rooted. She even suggests that those people's connections may be why film at the hospital was even able to happen. And more interestingly, this land has a ton of fond memories for her too. As the Korgo then drops to the ground, Ruby asks if gods can even get homesick. Dama suggests that this land they're on might actually be the Korgo's home. Tsukiyomi says that there are different types of gods though, like a god who created the world, or created the concept of the soul. Some may even love absurdity, while another might just love people. There are even gods who don't realize they're gods, with Ruby sounding perplexed when she hears that. It's a bit specific, but... It really does seem like Tsukiyomi is actually confirming the actual existence of all those gods in this verse, which is crazy. Even further, the Korgo suggests that they often receive help from the gods without even noticing, and that they should show the gods more respect. Could that mean Alka and Ruby have been helped by the gods before? I mean, I feel like that could also be confirming that their reincarnation was indeed the act of one of the gods as well. I really want to see those gods if this is true. But Ruby just says Tsukiyomi is making it sound like she's some big shot. However, it's also her turn to film some scenes next week, and Ruby asks if the Crow Girl can pull it off. Judging by her answer and reaction, saying not to underestimate her, the Crow Girl is ready to prove all the doubters wrong. And that's how the chapter ends. Tsukiyomi may be a god, but can't she act? Aka and Ruby can act, and they may also be gods too. At least, according to the Crow Girl back in chapter 127. By her definition of godhood, those who have memories of their previous lives can also be considered gods. The core girl also stated that she is the same kind of person who is able to transfer the memories of the dead to the body of a baby. That can either mean she's a reincarnate herself, or she's the one doing the reincarnations. Either way, the core girl is a god by her own definition, and if you take that definition as fact, Aka and Ruby are gods too. It really seems like Oshinoko might actually be full of gods, perhaps even a game of different gods pulling strings for their entertainment or other purposes. But yeah, this was certainly a decent chapter when it came to potentially add in to the lore. 
but hopefully next chapter we get back to some Akahubi interactions. Cause I know a lot of us want to see what their relationship is like now after the kiss. There is a break next week though, so we'll have to wait. But let me know what y'all think about Akahubi potentially being gods in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please drop a like and subscribe. I got some more Shinoko content here too that you can check out. Peace.